Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Amite County in Mississippi, in a wooded area about one mile south of Highway 23, as a young boy, I was out on the front porch with my mother, father, uncle, and grandfather. At around 9 p.m., we all heard a sound that was not unlike a shrill human scream. Until that night, I did not know what it meant to have your hair stand on end. A somewhat large dog that we had outside barked, cried, and ran away in apparent terror. The only thing we found the next day was a single partial footprint. The next encounter happened when my cousin and I were in the woods, fishing at a pond on our grandfather's property. We first noted a very strong odor that we took to be a skunk. We then heard a sound like a scream with a few grunts, then nothing. Before the next encounter, there were some unusual incidents that deserve mentioning. First was the finding of dead livestock, mainly pigs. They almost always had been found with their liver and heart removed. I never saw this myself, only heard the story. I did see, on at least two occasions, all of the fruit eaten off the trees on the property. In both cases, all of the fruit was removed from the trees and the pits on the ground around the trees. We laughed about the bellyache something would have from eating an entire tree of green pears. Later, as a teenager, I was alone in the woods. I had the distinct feeling I was being watched. I crossed a barbed wire fence near the road, crossed the road, and entered the woods there. When I returned to the road, a short time later, 20 to 30 minutes, I saw that the fence I had earlier crossed had been partially knocked down. Upon approaching the damaged fence, I noticed several large footprints. They appeared human in every aspect, except for their size. Even then, I wore a size 12D boot. The prints were at least two to three inches longer and maybe two inches wider than my boot. The tracks led first to the road, then back into the woods. Maybe a year later, a friend and I were in the woods. He was from New Orleans and knew nothing of the past encounter. While near Creek Bottom, he suddenly froze and asked me what was watching us. I stood near him and I saw what I first thought was a bear about 25 yards away. It was in a squatting position. It then stood upright. It was, I'm sure, seven to eight feet tall. The creature was covered with very dark brown hair over its entire body, with the exception of its face. It stood upright like a man, not stooped like a bear. As we departed the area, we watched it follow us. The creature had a long stride, and its arms swung as it walked. It followed us to the edge of the wood line, the only sounds it made were whistling noises. My next and last encounter did not occur until I was in the army. A co-worker and I went to the old house to do some shooting. We arrived late at night. As we sat outside talking, we saw a large man-shaped creature walk across the road about 125 yards away. It walked into the woods and disappeared. It did not seem to notice us. We found small trees knocked down in the woods. The trees were apparently then laid across each other. In all cases, we were either at the house or in the woods nearby, either hunting or fishing in one instance. There was a new story I heard that stated there were footprint casts taken near Macomb in Pike County. Just a few miles away, the person interviewed also had an audio recording of the creature. The first incident occurred in the fall. It was about 9 p.m. 
the weather was clear and moderately cool. The second incident occurred in the late summer a few years earlier. The time was about 4 p.m. The weather was, as I recall, partly cloudy and warm. The fruit tree incidents happened near the same time frame. The last sighting occurred in the winter. The weather was quite cool with a light fog in low areas. It was at least 10 p.m., possibly a little later. The area is rural wooded area with farms nearby. There are nearby creeks and low-lying swampy areas. The terrain consisted of low rolling hill. The nearest creek with a name is Hominy Creek. The east fork of the Amite River is within a few miles. On to the next one. In Hancock County, I lived in Mississippi when I was a child. I was about six years old when this occurred. I was asleep in my bedroom one night on the second floor of our home when the neighbor's dog began barking wildly at something in the yard. It made such noise that my siblings and I finally got out of bed to see what the commotion was all about. Looking down from our window, we saw something in the garden, which was right next to the house. There was only natural light, but the thing was only about 20 or 30 feet away, and I can still remember it vividly. It was squatting down, eating the vegetables from the plant there. I could even hear it eating from where I stood. A moment later, we all screamed in surprise and shock at what we saw. It looked up at us and kept right on eating. I remember that, by its mannerism, it had no fear of us whatsoever and made no attempt to leave the area or hide in any way. What I remember was a creature that was built like a human being. I can't say exactly how big it was, but I know it was bigger than the average person. It was covered all over with dark, shaggy brown hair, and when it looked up at us, as we stood in the window, its eyes glowed white in the darkness. Eventually, my grandfather woke up and saw it too. He went out the side door with his gun and fired up into the air. We continued to watch out of the window and then saw the creature stand up and run off on two legs into the woods toward the river. I remember it ran so fast that I could hardly believe it. The next morning, we found very large, human-like footprints in the garden. I had never seen anything like that before, and never have since. Nothing unusual was seen or heard before or after the incident. We were all asleep, late at night. It is a rural area, heavily wooded, we had two neighbors, but the populations there were thin. Our property was very near the Pearl River. On to the next one. In Adams County in Mississippi, several witnesses saw an almost human, huge, hairy creature that growled, once even growling at a dog. The creature walked with a limp and appeared curious. Large footprints, as well as other traces unspecified, were found. The creature ran away when a police car approached it. Three witnesses saw a huge, hairy man-beast over six feet tall that was dark, barefoot, and covered in hair. On to the next one. In Tunica County in Mississippi, Mr. and Mrs. Tom Jeff Rodney Jeff and a friend had two visits by a Bigfoot, and after this lay in wait for the third visit when they shot at it. On Friday night, the Joffs and their friends smelt a foul smell and heard a ruckus. On the next night, Saturday, they saw a seven to eight foot tall creature near the house. On Sunday night, Mr. Joff and his son Rodney waited for the Bigfoot, and Rodney fired at it as soon as he saw it. The creature seemed to be hit and ran away, 
but later that night, the same creature returned and pushed on the front door and broke the frame. On the next day, the Joffs found blood spots around the door, as well as tracks that were 16 to 18 inches long. On to the next one. At St. Adele in Quebec, in summer of 1951, there were several encounters possibly related to a strange Bigfoot or werewolf-type entity which had been reported in the area for centuries and called the Windigo by the native Abenaki tribes. One night, a child told his mother that he had seen a strange bear-like creature looking at him through the window. Later that night, the young child disappeared from his crib and was never seen again. Around the same time, a hunter named Desjardins went out to hunt on a beautiful moonlit night and disappeared. Only his rifle and pieces of his leather outfit were found. Also, two woodcutters who had previously mocked the Abenaki legend went camping. Later, one was found dead and horribly mutilated. The other had gone insane and died two days later. A woman went to visit her mountain cabin and returned the next day totally insane, and her cabin had been destroyed by a mysterious fire. She is rumored to have been sent to an institution in Montreal. On to the next one. At around 5 a.m. in August, three young men were walking along a road in Montreal in Quebec when they noticed a three-foot-tall, hairy, heavy-set figure lurking in some shadows. It had long, curving arms and was hunched over. Suddenly, it made a tremendous leap and disappeared. On to the next one. In Montegris City, St. Alexander, in Quebec, a 19-year-old youth claims he saw a tall, gray, hairy figure with glowing red eyes in a forested area. He shot at it, apparently wounding it. The creature ran into the woods and disappears, emitting loud howls. Police apparently investigated the case, but found nothing. On to the next one. In the tundra in Quebec, I was with my friends TB and Juana, and we were packing in for four days. I had just gotten that new 270, and the scope had not been sighted in. I decided we could do that after we ate. I paced off 100 yards and started fiddling with the scope. I panned across the meadow to where we always see Big Moose in the evening, but I didn't see one. Odd. As I panicked back, left toward the pool, I thought I saw a bear sitting in the pool. I focused in, and it was no bear. I couldn't get comfortable because I was on the hillside. I moved back and up toward the trees and went around to the left. It was downwind. I came to a flat spot and recited, Plain as day, there was Sasquatch sitting in the pond. I have never heard one sitting in water. TB's father saw one sitting on a log at Drake's camp. I thought it might be hurt, but it just sat there. It was not too hot. The creature was surrounded by clouds of gnats, flies, and mosquitoes. It got up and moved toward the boulders about 20 feet and leaned against the boulder and just stayed there. I suppose I saw it for six to eight minutes. It rolled in the grass by the boulders, then went back into the trees and toward the east. It's real rocky there. I blood trailed a deer back there once. That's it. I could not tell if it was a male or female. I would guess by looking at the boulders that it was about seven feet tall thinner than most reports I have heard, but still big. Dark brown, funny sort of walk, hunched over more than a man. On to the next one. In Saskatchewan, I was fishing in Upper Saskatchewan on the Churchill River when I saw a Bigfoot. I just caught the biggest northern pike of my life when I turned around in the boat in total fear I caught a glimpse of the animal on the bank of the river disappearing into the forest. It was approximately eight feet tall, 
with hair all over. I was approximately 100 yards from the animal. It took me a while to calm down and then went back to camp. I mentioned to the owner that I saw something strange in the forest and he tried to convince me that it was a bear walking upright with a cub through the forest. I did not say I saw a Bigfoot or a bear, just something strange. I have been ridiculed, so I have been quiet about this. The owner of the lodge tried to convince me that I saw a bear walking upright when I never told him anything about the animal except I saw something strange this morning in the woods. It was noon, fair sky, and sunny. On to the next one. This was near Sylvania, Tisdale, in Saskatchewan. Some friends and I were driving home from Barrier Lake in Saskatchewan. There are many lakes and thick pine forests in that area, and the rest is farmland. Anyways, we were coming home past midnight, and it was pitch black and raining with thunder and lightning. I was sitting in the middle of the back seat, looking in front on the passenger side, watching the ditch for deer that might run in front of us. There was this flash of lightning that lit up the sky, and I saw what looked like a person running through the field, cross the ditch and the road in front of us, across the other side, and disappear into the tree line that was on the driver's side. By then, the lightning flash was done, and I couldn't see anything to the sides anymore with the darkness and the rain. I would say that the lightning lit the sky up in a series of flashes that lasted maybe six seconds. In that time, whatever I saw moved a considerable distance, guessing 20 yards or more, so quickly that only one other person besides myself saw anything. The only other person to see it was the person who is in front on the passenger side who is always looking into the ditch spotting for deer. The ditches are shallow and not very wide along the fields, so when I saw it, the thing was coming out of the field and crossing the ditch and road to the other side right in front of us. I was focused on that side and followed it along with eyes locked on it. I'd say it moved extremely fast and crossed the road itself in one stride. The two of us that were focused on the passenger side ditch had time to focus on it and follow it. I'd say I had six to eight seconds of seeing it running. The best look I got was in the field and ditch because that is when the sky was lit. By the time it crossed the road in front of the headlights, it was already dark again. So for the driver and anyone else, it would have crossed so quick they didn't even notice anything cross the road. My memory of it as it crossed the road and had life was both its arms moved twice in a pumping motion on two legs, the same as humans do when running. I think that if all you saw was a split-second blur of something moving at night in the rain, it makes sense that the only people focused on the passenger side ditch looking for deer saw it. What we saw was shaped just like a very tall person running. Exactly. Two legs making long strides, arms pumping side by side. The really unsettling thing to me is that it was like the form of a man, but it was not a man. What I saw was completely black, a type of black darker than anything I have seen before or since. There was no shine to it. You could not make out any features, even with the headlights on it. You could not see hair or anything, just a deep black human shape running in the middle of nowhere at night. The first person to comment about it was the person in front who got excited and said someone just ran in front of the vehicle. The immediate response, since we were far from any towns or farms, was that it must have been a deer. Then she said no, it was black, and was adamant that it was black and it was someone. This is my feelings also. A few yards ahead on the driver's side, where the thing we saw ran, was an old graveyard. So, naturally, being teenagers, the others started making jokes that she saw a ghost. I hadn't spoken up about what I saw yet because I was in shock and kind of spooked. Coming up on the graveyard right after didn't help either. I talked to her later about it, and we saw exactly the same thing. We both believed we saw a person that was pitch black in form. We actually did come to the conclusion that we had seen some sort of spirit 
until I started reading Bigfoot encounters online and the descriptions of them. Then I thought maybe what I saw was a lot like what people are describing as Bigfoot. I guess that makes more sense than a ghost, right? I do know I saw something that gave me an eerie feeling that I still carry with me all these years later thinking about it. Bigfoot? Ghost? Whatever we saw was not a human, but it appeared like one in form. I know most will probably think it was an animal like a deer or a bear. We're all from a farming community, so we know animals. We see deer running in front of us all the time. This is why we were looking out for them. Same with bears. I know what a bear looks like, and it isn't six to seven feet tall and running on two legs with very long strides. Even a bear standing and stepping forward, you know what I mean. Anyway, that is what I saw, whatever it was. If it was a Bigfoot, I'm thinking it could have been out of the forest and more in open areas because the Canadian Army had a lot of soldiers, helicopters, and jeeps patrolling. The soldiers were going deep into the forest searching for a young girl who was lost. The forest gets very thick in that area, even though Saskatchewan is known for fields mostly. On to the next one. This was near a cult in Skamania County in Washington. It was foggy, and we had never been on this road before. So we had stopped the pickup and got out to check the road ahead on foot. We were walking south on the road. We heard rocks tumbling down from above us. We decided to return to the truck and turn around and not risk going any further. As we were walking back to the truck, I noticed footprints going uphill from the road in an area we were walking not more than 10 minutes before. I wear a size 12D boot and I was able to put my whole boot inside of these freshly made footprints. We all got scared and ran the rest of the way back to the truck. As I was turning the truck around, I was looking over my shoulder out the window and noticed a large, dark, hairy animal walking upright past about 50 feet behind us. It looked right at us and kept going. We left the area immediately. There were three other people with me, we had all gotten out to check the road conditions. No drugs or alcohol was involved. The time was around 1 p.m. The weather was foggy, but plenty of light to see clearly. We were on the edge of the tree line. Nearby landmarks include the summit of Silver Stars Mountain and Pyramid Rocks. On to the next one. near Mount St. Helens below Ape Caves. This was near Cougar in Cowlitz County in Washington. I just like to state that I'm not the witness. I'm making this report out on her behalf. There was a huge crashing through underbrush. She described it as a very rapid thrashing, crashing sound, twigs snapping, etc. It was followed by a loud, high-pitched scream. She likened it to a woman screaming. She said, it was very close based on the distance she pointed out to me, maybe about 30 to 50 yards. She said she and the four other people she was camping with were absolutely terrified and left the area right away. There were five witnesses, the woman, her younger brother, her boyfriend, her brothers, her brother's two roommates. It happened at dawn, unsure of the conditions at the time of the sighting, but it was in July or August, so the weather overall was fairly hot. On to the next one. My cousin and I were spending a weekend fishing on the south fork of the Nooksack River. The exact location was at the end of the Strand Road off of Highway 9 between Cedro Woolley and Mount Baker Highway. We were both going into the eighth grade our parents dropped us off on a Friday and would pick us up on Sunday. Crazy, weren't they? We set up camp fairly close to the end of the road, about 50 feet from the river. We spent Friday afternoon fishing and came back to our camp and built a fire. Finally, we went to bed. We both stuck our pocket knives in the sand next to us 
in case we needed them at night. I was startled awake in the middle of the night by a sound, and as I awoke, sleeping in my sleeping bag, saw the silhouette of something on the other side of a small fence and slightly above us. It was about 20 feet away. There was a full moon behind, which created a perfect silhouette image. This creature made a series of long, hissing-type sounds. Then it would stop for a bit and do it again. It did this five to six times. The silhouette was from about the waist up. It was broad-shouldered with no neck. It had a sloping forehead and no noticeable ears that I could detect. It rocked slightly from side to side as if it were smelling us or trying to see us laying there a bit better. It could not have gotten right beside us without going through this fence and under some small branches. It appeared that it was likely crouching down, maybe on one knee. I was obviously petrified. It was there for probably three to five minutes. When it left, it kind of pivoted its entire body to its right and was gone. I would estimate this to be about three in the morning. I heard nothing as it walked away. I laid there for the rest of the night, frozen stiff with fright. To the point that my body began cramping up, I did not hear anything as it left, nor smelled anything. I did hear shortly after it left, from the direction of the river, and sounding like across the river, a series of clicks, with what sounded like rocks being hit together very rapidly. They were hit together three to five times very fast. I heard this a few times fairly close, then further off as if going away from us. My cousin did not hear a thing, sleeping away. We stayed there the following night without incident. Although, with a big fire going and fishing line tied to each other's wrists, should we need to wake each other. In the morning, I told my cousin and we looked for tracks, but did not see anything. The field that this thing was in was hard packed and it was very hard and dry, so no indentation. I know what I saw. It was not a man nor a bear nor someone trying to scare us, making growling sounds or something. None of that. It makes the hair stand on my neck as I recount this incident, even though it has been nearly 30 years ago. It was the middle of the night, with a full moon behind the creature creating a perfect silhouette. At the end of the road to the right, about 40 feet or so, we camped on the right side, slightly down from the far edge of the riverbank. This was slightly elevated from the sand and rocks of the riverbank as it sloped gently to the river. A few months later, there was a report in the Bellingham Herald, where I lived at the time, about someone seeing a Bigfoot along the Mount Baker Highway, although the sighting was much closer to Bellingham. That sighting was around where the Mosquito Lake Road meets the Mount Baker Highway. The newspaper article mentioned a guy and number to call if anybody saw anything. My cousin and I called the guy who actually took us to the Strand Road location where we showed him exactly where my sighting was. We found no evidence. Again, it was a few months later. On to the next one. In Kalalam County in Washington, on the coastal highway, I am a retired professional hunter with worldwide hunting experience, and I am quite knowledgeable in the field of zoology. Therefore, I am quite certain of what I saw. The region is extremely dense rainforest and old growth, very steep and mountainous canyon stream. I saw a huge, hairy, broad-shouldered man-like creature. It came out of a one-half-mile-deep narrow ravine. I was hunting with a pack of dogs for black bears and mountain lions. The dogs went into the canyon, and out came this slow, ape-like creature. His back was toward me, so I never got a clear view of his face. He was about 75 yards in front of me. It was seven and a half to eight feet tall, maybe six to seven hundred pounds and moved very slowly and cautiously. It moved around the dogs to my surprise, and when the danger to it passed, it slowly climbed back down into the ravine and out of sight. No sound was heard. However, a strong odor of a rancid nature hung in the air for quite some time. 
On to the next one. Near North Fork of Loggy Creek in Yakima County, Washington, a rancher, 60 plus, watched in horror as a large, hairy being with an overpowering stench came to his cattle camp and approached his campfire. It had followed his dog and stood on the edge of the firelight. The dogs were paralyzed with fear. Finally, it shuffled back into the forest. In the morning, the stench still lingered. On to the next one. This happened in Olympia, Washington. Kirk and Kelly D., just before the start of school in late August or 1st of September, attended a late baseball game in Elma, Washington, and had returned by bus to the vicinity of Satsop. They were walking home at about 1 a.m., the one and a half miles, to their isolated home on the outskirt of Satsop on East Satsop, a rural road. They heard some soft noises behind them and noticed a large, dark object at the side of the road that they first took for a sign of some kind. As they continued walking, the sign followed them, and they took off running as fast as they could as the dark figure followed along, walking at a seemingly leisurely pace, never breaking into a run, but easily keeping up with the boys. They jumped over the split rail fence of the first and only house before their own, one of them getting substantially scratched by black hawthorn bushes and pounded on the door of the house. The lady owner recognized them as neighbors, let them in as they hysterically told her that something was after them and that it was outside. The lady said something like, oh, there are no monsters, and opened the door. The Sasquatch had, by this time, stepped over the picket fence and was standing in the front yard of her place. She said, good God, there it is and jumped back into the house, slamming the door. The three looked out of a small window in the door. By this time, it was about 12 feet from the porch. The boys described the creature as about 10 to 12 feet tall, subsequently reducing it to 8 feet or slightly more by measurement of tree limbs under which it had passed. Hair light grayish brown, 3 to 6 inches long, covering the body and most of the face, flat nosed, long arms, wide shoulders and narrow hips, long legs. The creature stayed briefly in the yard looking at the house. When it stepped back over the fence and walked across the street, the observers cracked open the front door again to observe it. It walked down a 75 degree embankment from the road to the river plain about a hundred feet below. The boys recovered and walked the remaining 400 yards home with borrowed flashlight and called Wayne Moore, a neighbor, at first light of dawn. He subsequently found footprints 17 inches long, 8 inches wide at the ball, and 4 inches at the heel, and traced them down river for about half a mile before the tracks entered the water. Despite being scared, Kirk and Kelly participated in looking for the creature during the following week. Wayne Moore, who lives only a block west of Stevens Road, added that he was awakened many nights by something large, walking or running through his yard such that he could feel the ground shake. Within a week and within about 300 yards of the sighting, a pile of feces was found. On to the next one. My brother-in-law Dan told me of his experience and it goes something like this. He had gone up to visit some people camping in a trailer. As he arrived, and turned off his motorcycle engine, he observed something dark in color moving on an open hillside below a timber line. There was snow on the ground, it was getting towards dusk, and it was a little foggy. The thing was 250 yards away, approximately. As Dan observed this thing, he noticed it was quite tall, seven feet or more in height. This thing let Dan know that he saw Dan by looking back directly at Dan, as he continued walking uphill towards the timber. He looked back at Dan several times without breaking his stride. His stride was long, longer than a man's, and was effortless as he walked through the snow. Dan thought what kind of man would be wearing a dark, hairy suit that covered his entire body out in the forest. Dan also noticed that this thing 
was much bigger than any man he had seen, and its build was very big. Dan felt it could weigh a good 600 pounds or so. This creature disappeared into the timber. Dan knew he had seen something very unusual, and he was aware of Bigfoot sightings in the news. He just let his story go all these years until I am now reporting it to you. It was dusk with some fog. He could see the thing clearly, though. The area is pine forest with an open hillside below the tree line. I have read of four sightings out of Levensworth, Washington in Chelan County. The sightings go back to 1976. Levensworth is about 20 minutes from where he had his sighting. On to the next one. In Puyallup in Pierce County in Washington, it was on an old pipeline road 94th Avenue East by a gravel pit that existed in the 70s up in the South Hill in Puyallup. The witness had a vivid recall of the sighting that day. Although she was 12 years old at the time, it has haunted her for all these years. A bipedal creature was sighted at a distance of 200 yards. The Sasquatch was big, but no other dimensions could be determined. The creature paused as it crossed the road, then turned and faced the bike riders. As they approached, it looked at them, then again turned and continued to cross the road. It disappeared into the thick cover. When they got to the crossing area, they saw nothing and pedaled home stricken with fear. They told their parents, who did not take them seriously, and the entire matter was dropped. The witness distinctly remembers being woken up late at night by horrible, loud, screaming vocalizations. These lasted for weeks in the general area of the neighborhood. We had been hearing the screams for a few weeks, and the dogs at night would go nuts. The only witnesses were myself and a little boy around the age of 12. People were saying that they had heard the sound of Bigfoot, but not sure how long this had been going on for. It was during the day, and it was sunny and nice. On to the next one. Paige and I had set off for a day hike, following a section of the Adirondack Trail in upstate New York. We were both wearing light jackets for the day, knowing that the temps would be in the 50s and that we would be walking very briskly. That was lapse number one. Secondly, neither of us were carrying a compass, which both of us assumed that the trail we took in would be easy enough to follow back out, which, as it turns out, was lapse number two. Thirdly, we had brought a reasonable amount of water for the day, as well as a limited amount of food, the two of us planning to have a hearty meal together come dinner time. That was lapse number three. Because of the two of us, we had a combined nine years of education. Despite our education in this hike, we were incapable of making between us one solid decision in regards to safety and our own well-being. As a warning to all of those out there who care to heed a warning, even though we began our day by following what is purported to be a major hiking trail in the region, only hours into the day's hike, we had already made several bad decisions as to which trail was the real trail while we were hiking. Around one o'clock in the afternoon, a strong wind had kicked up, and within about 40 minutes' time, what was a sunny sky spotted with puffy white clouds had turned dense and gray, completely obscuring the sun. Soon after, we had lost our bearings entirely, and we were lost. For the next seven hours, for all I knew, we were hiking in circles. The realization came upon us that the temperature had dropped about 10 degrees, and with the wind now howling, we were going to have to spend the night alone in the forest. Or so we thought. With no flashlights in our possession, we did our best to rip down some pine boughs and create a windbreak to hide behind for the night. At 9 p.m., it was jet black in the trees, and I was never so afraid in all of my life, with the night activities just about to begin. We had about half a gallon of water left between the two of us, a small package of cheese and crackers, and a health bar of some sort. At around 11 o'clock, a scream rang out in the wood, which sounded like a cross between a witch and a woman being murdered. It was the most bone-chilling, blood-curdling thing that either of us had ever heard in our lives. 
and it sounded relatively close. As our eyes adjusted to the thick darkness which surrounded us, it felt as though the wind over our head was gusting to some 50 miles per hour at times, causing the trees both overhead as well as around us to rock and sway, which created a barrage of sounds in the wood. There were creaks and cracks occurring everywhere and anywhere, as the two of us were hunkered against the tree trying to stay warm. It was at 11.45 p.m. when I heard a loud groan. It sounded like it was very close to us, and Paige screamed in fear. As we both tried to focus our eyes in the direction of the noise, which was by no means a tree noise. Rather, it was deep and guttural, sounding like that of a caveman. Paige said to me, Oh my God, there's something moving in the woods over there. And I immediately saw what she had seen. There was a massive silhouette of a figure, darker than that of the woods. It was standing in, and it was only perhaps 50 feet or less from where we were sitting. Paige and I looked at each other in the eyes, in the dark, and when we looked back, whatever we had seen was gone. A short while later, we began to hear what sounded like gibberish coming from out in the woods. It started very quietly, sounding like two unintelligible people having a conversation, and then it escalated. There were two or more voices. One seemed to be shouting as the other or others were replying back in quieter, subtler tone. Whatever was being communicated was not English, albeit it did sound like a language, not animal speak. It was now about 2.30, and some stars were visible in the sky as the dense cloud cover seemed to be breaking up. A short while later, the glow of the latent stage of a waning moon became visible in what we know was the east. We waited for almost an hour until we were sure of east from west and we decided to start moving toward the southwest, which was how we had begun the day. I know there were many who are already saying what a stupid thing to do, but we were cold and frightened and we could actually see little enough so that we wouldn't run into a tree or walk off a cliff. And so we began to move. Arm in arm, the two of us hiked for hours with our hands outstretched to block any unseen branches from our faces. For the first two hours of our walking, the gibberish persisted at our right-hand side. But never did it get any closer as far as our hearing was concerned. Whatever these things were, they were flanking us as we walked in the darkness. At about 4.45 a.m., the sky began to glow behind us, and the slice of moon was overhead. A sense of calm and actual joy came over us, followed by the realization that the sounds had stopped as well. We continued to walk until 7 a.m., having consumed half of our remaining water when we spied out a highway below our position and made our way towards it. It took us 45 minutes until we were standing on the road, not knowing what road it was or where we were, but we weren't in the woods anymore, and that's all that counted. We sat on the side of the highway until a man came by and we waved him down. He was on his way back to work and when we told him about our ordeal, he told us to get in and actually drove us to where our car was parked and it was all over. We know we saw and heard Bigfoot that night. The dimensions of the figure we saw standing in the trees was unbelievable. It looked like a sheet of plywood standing there on two legs, being both tall and wide. Had there not been so much noise from the wind and trees, I am confident we would have heard them moving, but it was impossible under the conditions we found ourselves in. It seemed they were following us or escorting us out of the woods, a fact which we will never know, but had they wanted to attack us, they could have, and they didn't. On to the next one. We had been hiking for several days, following the snake, as we call it, when we found ourselves situated on an embankment perhaps several hundred feet in height, overlooking the snake and the Tetons in the distance. From our position atop this hillside, we had a panoramic view of the opposing bank of the river, which extended as far as the eye could see in virtually any direction. Specifically, the bank that was directly opposite to us had very little, if any, tree cover. The cover that was visible grew gradually denser the further from the river it was. Several members of our group, 
almost at the same moment in time, began to point out several dark-colored animals moving through the trees on the other side. From our perspective, without the aid of any devices, these animals appeared as small black specks in the distance, but that would soon change. Each of the members of the group had their own pair of binoculars, which we now had taken out, as we all had our binoculars fixed on what previously had been three dark specks walking along in the trees, the consensus was resounding. What we were seeing were three Bigfoot walking along the snake, one of them being quite a bit larger than the other two, and all of them walking in single file. From this distance, even with the aid of our binoculars, there was virtually no detail to be seen other than recognizing their unusual gait and swinging arms. Their arms swing in a very robotic fashion as though they are two stiff appendages hanging from their sides, which are hinged at the shoulders. The three of them were all walking in what appeared to be a forward tilt, which is most certainly different than that of a human being. Their steps were uniform and very deliberate, showing no variation the entire time that we were watching. We had eyes on them for about half an hour before they were out of view within the trees. About ten minutes later, they reappeared in a clearing further up the river, but by this time, they were at least a mile away from our position. Once again, they appeared as specks, even with the aid of our binoculars. As you would imagine, there was quite a conversation going on between us as to what we collectively had just seen. Many in the group didn't believe they existed. Speaking for myself, I believed, but with certain reservation. This day had changed all of that for everyone. We knew exactly what we were looking at, and that beyond the shadow of a doubt. These were in no way three hikers wearing black. They had brown fur coverings that was visible from head to toe. They were carrying no supplies, and they were wearing no footwear. All of these things being a recipe for death in this area for a human, and yet there they were before our eyes. On to the next one. The year was 1915, and a feisty 12-year-old boy had just had a terrible fight with his father. Angry and perhaps a little stubborn as well, the boy left his home in Blount County, Tennessee, near Maryville. Determination etched on his face. He would show his father. He would walk all the way to his grandparents' house, even though his grandparents lived on the other side of the Great Smoky Mountains in North Carolina. Wandering along what is now U.S. Highway 441 through the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, but was then little more than a deeply rutted wagon trail, the boy pushed onward through the mountain. Shortly, he reached the summit at Indian Gap and then began the long, slow descent into western North Carolina. Somewhere along the way, the snow began to fall. It was almost springtime in the Smokies, being late March, but Old Man Winter is still known to blow a chill in the higher elevations of the rugged mountains, sometimes well into April. The boy considered himself tough and knowledgeable of wood lore, but he hadn't counted on a freak snowstorm blowing in while on his trek. By the time he tried to find somewhere to seek refuge for the night, it was too late. Tired, the boy lay down underneath a craggy rock overhang very near where the Appalachian Trail passes through the National Park and went to sleep. He never awakened, having frozen to death in the below-freezing temperatures of the howling mountain, wind, and wet heavy snowfall. Sometime later, after the snow had passed, a group of hunters found the boy's body underneath the overhang and carried him all the way back to what was then the Sugarlands area of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Unknown to anyone in the area and carrying nothing that could identify him, the boy was placed in a simple unmarked grave, and there he remained for unknown, unnamed, and unclaimed for over 60 years, thanks to a retired National Park Service ranger the mystery of the wandering boy was solved. 
having led many campers along the old Sugarland Trail, Ranger Butch McDade knew the story of how the boy was found by heart. But what neither he nor anyone else knew was who the boy was, where he came from, and how he ended up frozen to death in the wilderness at the tender age of 12, with no one ever coming forth to claim the body. A simple blank slab was later placed to mark the grave where the boy was buried in 1915. But now, thanks to the diligence of Ranger McDade and something short of a miracle, another headstone had been added. It bears the name Ed McKinley. In 2009, Ranger Butch McDade retired from the National Park Service after serving five years in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Over the years, Butch had spent many hours conducting extensive research on the mystery of Ed McKinley, the wandering boy. Butch states that unlike the case of Dennis Martin, the family and relatives of little Ed McKinley passed away with at least some closure in knowing the fate of the poor, long-lost boy. The beauty of this story, Butch says, as opposed to other mysteries of people vanishing in the Smokies, is that this brought closure, at least for some family members, McDade said. It's a compelling human interest story with a nice ending. It was through the process of this extensive research that Butch McDade eventually uncovered a series of strange coincidences that led to the eventual positive identification of it being Ed's remains as those that occupied the sad, unmarked grave. One of Butch's greatest assets and valuable sources of key information was a man by the name of Glenn Cardwell. Cardwell was raised on a farm inside what is today the National Park and had also spent 34 years serving as a park ranger in the Great Smokies. At one time, Cardwell was even the mayor of the town of Pittman Center, just east of the city of Gatlinburg. He was still in office well into his 80s. At that time, the oldest serving mayor in the state of Tennessee, and was for years the oldest living link to the tragic story of Little Ed. Way back in May of 1975, Cardwell was temporarily assigned to the Sugarland Visitor Center, one afternoon, an elderly lady by the name of Virgie Smith from the nearby city of Knoxville, Tennessee, came in and told the sad story of her brother who had run away from home in 1915 and was never seen or heard of again. She inquired at the reception desk where she might begin to look for any information someone at the park might have by chance. The young girl park volunteer, who was at the desk, pointed to Glenn Cardwell who just so happened to be in the visitor center that day and said that if anyone here would know anything about it, it would be him. Cardwell made his way over to the reception desk and listened intently as Smith tearfully described her family's years of attempts to find the truth and to bring closure to her young brother's disappearance. Virgie's impassioned plea jogged Cardwell's mind and he recalled a handwritten letter that he had on file for years the letter was from none other than Gatlinburg resident, Lucinda, daughter of legendary mountain storyteller and guide Wiley Oakley. Lucinda, being a member of one of the area's founding families, had a very keen interest in the stories and folklore of the National Park and had written Cardwell a note in regards to a news article she'd heard recently at the time about a search and rescue effort in the Great Smokies for another lost little boy. In the letter, Lucinda made a casual reference to a memory she had of the tale of an unidentified boy whose body had been brought to the Sugarlands community in the early 1990s. He had been found frozen to death beneath a rock overhang a short distance away from what is known today as the Appalachian Trail. Glenn Cardwell picked up the phone at the reception desk and called Lucinda directly, gave a brief explanation for the call and handed the phone over to Virgie Smith. When Smith realized that what Lucinda began telling her was most likely a first-hand account of what had become of her long-lost brother after all these years, Virgie Smith openly wept. Looking back, Cardwell has often said that this very moment was the absolute pinnacle of his career with the National Park Service. I give thanks to God. I just happened to be at the visitor center that day. 
he was later quoted as saying, Cardwell decided he would take Smith to visit Lucinda at her home to hear the entire story in person, so they left the Sugarlands Visitor Center together. At Lucinda's home, Virgie Smith learned that her runaway brother had been found by a pair of men as they returned from a hunting trip. Upon discovering his cold, lifeless body, they carried him the rest of the way to the Sugarlands community in order to have his body claimed. However, they had no luck and no one stepped forward to claim or identify the body. The good people of the Sugarlands community waited a few days, and when the body still hadn't been claimed, they decided to proceed with the burial for the poor little boy. Little Ed was dressed in a crisp white shirt and a pair of overalls, and he was laid to rest in a cleared corner on the hillside. They felt the least they could do was to give him some fresh clothes and a proper Christian burial. Every resident of the Sugarlands community came to pay their respects to the unknown boy, and it is said that so many flowers were brought by them that little Ed's grave was the most decorated in the graveyard. Since the death appeared to be accidental, there was no official investigation by the authorities. Although the details and dates made Virgie Smith sure this had been her brother, it was one detail from Lucinda that convinced her this was, indeed, her long-lost sibling. Upon hearing from Lucinda's brother, Ernest, who had been 10 years old at the time and had even helped dig the lost boy's grave, that the boy had red hair, it left Virgie absolutely convinced. Her brother, Ed McKinley, had been a redhead as well. Virgie once again broke down to tears. About six months later, in September of 1975, a small group drove up the old road now referred to as the Old Sugarlands Trail to the quiet mountain graveyard. The small group of mourners included Virgie Smith, her son Don, and Lucinda. Proudly leading the somber procession was none other than park ranger Glenn Cardwell. The group had with them a recently carved marble slab bearing little Ed McKinley's name and the date of his birth and death. The headstone was small, but impressive and weighed close to 200 pounds. Don Smith, Ed McKinley's nephew, helped lift the slab onto the burial site, where it was carefully laid at the foot of the plain piece of fieldstone that had served to mark the final resting place of the unknown wandering boy. Miss Smith wanted to make one last stab at solving her brother's mystery before she died, Butch McDade stated. She wanted to tie up loose ends. I'm sure she had been a searcher all her life. And now, the ghost of little Ed McKinley, the wandering boy of the Smoky Mountains, rests in peace. On to the next one. One of the drivers on my route saw a winged creature in Zephyr Hills, Florida. Well, I want to update you and tell you that I was off work a couple of nights ago, and the guy who covered my shift, a different driver from the original, also saw the creature. He texted me early in the morning and told me he was a believer now because he also saw the thing. His description was that it was tall, like six feet or so. He said it was dark gray, and he also said that it had a wide wingspan. Its body was very skinny, and in segments like an ant. Thorax, abdomen, he said it flew over the road from left to right. He said it flew so fast that it was hard to really make out what it actually looked like. It was in the same area of the previous sighting. But instead of on Route 98, it was on US 301, which is a road that 98 leads to. U.S. 301, a much longer and darker road than Route 89. He also said that there were deer everywhere. So, I'm starting to think that this thing eats deer. On to the next one. In Zephyr Hills, Florida, my sister and son have been experiencing some strange phenomenon. We weren't sure whether it had a demonic origin, spiritual in some way, or what in the world it could be. 
we had cleansed the house in the spiritual sense with holy oil and prayer. This had not worked. It started with scratching noises in the walls, along with heavy, human-like steps on our roof, right before or after. The steps were fast. There was fluttering noises of wings of a sort. We noticed that there was a large cement block on the bottom of the house moved out, no longer sealed tight as usual. We somehow packed this in a file in our minds in order to deal with ordinary life on life's terms. However, the enormous wings on this creature we have witnessed has really taken us to a different chapter in life. We had heard noises scratching on the wall, fluttering of wings, and human-like steps on our roof. And finally, we eyewitnessed the strange phenomenon. My son yelled for me while in the bathroom. He said, please come now. It's right out the window. I ran and looked out the window. There were noises coming from below the window, like it came and stretched up. I saw blackish darkness almost cover the entire window. It was part of a wing, a very small part. I say this because it hovered up quickly with two enormous wings at about five feet each. I only saw the back of its head, which was blackish in color. It went ever so quickly in the air, away from the house, and gone. What the heck is this? On to the next one. I live in Florida, and about six months ago, on the way to work, early in the morning, I swear I saw a gargoyle in the Brandon, Florida area, not too far from Zephyr Hills. I was on my way to work. It was about 6.40 a.m., and quite a few months ago, it was very dark out, very still, as I approached an intersection. It was a red light, so I stopped and was about three cars back. When the light turned green, I looked up, and off in the distance, there was a human-sized gargoyle-looking thing flying across the sky. I'd say probably two to three hundred feet up and a good distance away. It was pretty quick, but it flew behind some trees and a building, so I lost sight of it. I was in so much awe of what I was looking at, I couldn't even muster a single word to get the guy in the truck with me to look up at it. I had an incident in Tampa, Florida, a winged creature sighting. I was driving to work early in the morning. It wasn't dark, but not quite daylight. Driving around a curve on the road where I know I'm approaching a light, it's always red and I always have to stop. For one of the only times I can remember, I somehow was the very first vehicle stopped at the intersection. I knew I needed to keep an eye on the light, so I'm looking up, waiting for it to turn green. At that moment, I just happened to catch sight of something moving along to my left. It was flying from left to right, south to north. I won't lie, I did not get to see it for long, but... In that one to three seconds, it was as clear as I could possibly have imagined. It looked just like a gargoyle. Large bat-like wings, hands crunched up tight in front, legs kind of pulled up along the body as well. It was gliding along. The wings never flapped. Now, I don't claim to have the world's greatest eye or am I an expert on all things related to distance, but I know what it looked like. I'm certain of its size, which would be about the size of a large man. And I know it wasn't that far in front of me. I had a lot of objects in my foreview to help get a good perception. Could it have been anything else other than a gargoyle? Of course. I'm not crazy. That's just what it looked like. On to the next one. December 3rd, 2004. Time, 6 to 7 p.m. Weather conditions, clear and already dark. Moon hasn't risen yet. Location, traveling south on Route 2 in West Virginia from Point Pleasant to Huntington, West Virginia, near Ashton, West Virginia. A friend and I were traveling on Route 2 towards Huntington, West Virginia. 
I was on my way to set up my booth for an art show, and my mind was occupied with the booth set up and the show logistics. We had just gone over the railroad tracks outside of Ashton, West Virginia, and were on a long, straight stretch of road. There was distant oncoming traffic, and the headlights were on. There were no cars behind us in sight. I was in the passenger seat, and my friend was driving. I noticed a sudden movement in the sky over the Ohio River to my right in front of the car. It was a grayish, smooth, winged shape. The shape swooped in a figure eight in front of the windshield and then was suddenly gone to the left of us. It didn't fly out of sight. It was just gone. This happened very quickly, but I'm a visual artist. It was impressed into my memory banks. The size, it was bigger than the car. The wing spread was wider than the two-lane road we were on. The wings seemed to stretch wider somehow as it did the figure eight swoop. It was never more than 25 feet away from us as it flew towards the windshield. We thought it was going to crash into the windshield. At one point during the swoop, it was only about five feet off the pavement. The color, gray, translucent like a jellyfish, as it banked and swooped. I could see many angles of it, and somehow it looked more transparent as it turned some parts to us. I immediately thought it was like a manta ray. The body was floating like a manta ray or a bat. The wings were long and smooth and sort of pointed at the tip. I saw no texture or roughness on it, only smooth surface. The characteristics. Only body and no wings, head, eyes, tail, or feet. It did not look humanoid in any way. On the other hand, it wasn't a bird either. It moved more like something in the ocean would move. It did not flap the wings like a bird or flutter them like a bat, but just stretch them instead. My friend, who, alas, passed away a year ago, said to him the wings looked ragged like there were pieces coming off of them. He also said he got a good look at the underneath and it looked gray and smooth. This absolutely was not a machine. It was articulated like a living creature and it seemed like something organic. As I look back on this sighting, I wonder if it was something playing with us. It happened so quickly that the only scary part was when we thought it was going to crash into the windshield. It was so beautiful and strange. It reminded me of a sea creature more than anything else. Maybe our air is like water to them. The only other time in my life I've ever seen anything remotely similar was in the year 2000 in Clay County, West Virginia, driving along a one-lane road along the Elk River. A river was present in both instances I just realized. In that case, I was alone, and for about a mile as I drove, I kept noticing a shimmer in front of the car about 15 feet ahead of the car. This was late morning in the summer. It preceded the car at the same distance for several minutes. Then I noticed a shadow on the road, too large and shaped sort of like a bird. I looked up out of the windshield and there was a large crow flying above me. But what I first saw in front of the car was not a shadow. It was a disturbance in the air in front of my car that looked like a heat mirage, sort of, but was very close. This was a curvy country road right by the river. I had never seen heat mirages on that road before or since. At the time, I thought that it was sort of weird. Then, very close to that time, I had very lucid dreams that I was in my car, flying over the river right near the place where I saw the shadow, as an artist. My mind is open to many possibilities and explanations. I think the unseen world is just a small vibrational frequency away. As a child, I was fascinated by fairies and nature spirit and spent a lot of time alone outdoors. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell 
and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!